Okay everybody, welcome to the September Virtual Planetarium with Pete Lawrence and myself and as ever we will start with the inner solar system and work our way outwards. So starting with the planet Mercury then, well the planet isn't really visible at the start of the month when it will technically be an evening object setting before the sun. It's really too faint for daytime conditions and inferior conjunction occurs on the 6th of September and at that point Mercury lies between the Earth and the sun. So not really visible then, but after inferior conjunction, it emerges into the morning sky, and then things become much better, don't they? Yes, they do. I mean, the evening condition has a very shallow ecliptic angle, which is why Mercury is in such a poor position at the very beginning of September. But as we go past inferior conjunction and Mercury begins to move into the morning sky, the ecliptic makes a very steep angle with the eastern horizon in the morning before sunrise. So Mercury climbs really quickly and will have a much more favourable appearance of the little planet. So that's quite good. It'll reach uh, greatest western elongation on the 22nd of September because it's moving along a part of its orbit which is uh, nearer to the Earth, isn't it? So it's much quicker uh, to reach this position. Um, western elongation yeah um, so that means it'll be moving to a very favorable position quite rapidly and it'll be shining at magnitude minus 0.3 and rising over 100 minutes before the sunrise on the 22nd of september so that's not too bad at all no, it's rather good. And the, the interesting thing about this, uh, I have done a lot of Mercury observation recently, but I only do it in the sort of springtime sky. And it's very difficult to see Mercury against a dark sky at that time of year. Whereas this time, as you say, Mercury rising 100 minutes from before the sun, this is a good time to try and see Mercury against a dark sky, which makes the, uh, the surface easier to see. So you do the springtime sky because you're a fair weather astronomer and it's easier to do in the evening sky? Oh, I knew you wouldn't be able to help yourself. <laughs> yes, Pete, it's entirely that. I choose it because that's when I, I often forget about the morning elongation. So uh, I have been on holiday frequently when it's been at its best, but these are all very poor excuses. You're quite right. I need to put some effort in. No, I'm just as bad, actually. Um, OK, well, let's move on to Venus, which is also a morning object yes. and shine Shining at magnitude minus 4.3 at the start of September, rising almost two hours before the sun. By the end of the month, it brightens fractionally, not that you'll be able to see it, by 0.1 of a magnitude to minus 4.4, which is pretty bright, actually, for, for even for Venus. And as it approaches greatest western elongation next month, its position improves. And by the 30th of September, it rises four hours before the sun above the east-northeast horizon. So if you've been missing Venus from the evening sky, then you need to get up early in the morning in September and October, and you'll see it shining away there. It really is incredibly bright. Um, seeing that in a, against a dark sky is quite startling sometimes. A number of times it's caught me out and I thought it was an aircraft or a brilliant iridium flare. It's only when it doesn't move you realise, oh yes, that's the planet Venus. <laughs> yes, and of course it, it can cast shadows. I've, I've photographed shadows um, statically, but I've also, uh, when I've been doing... Uh, night flights taking people to see the aurora for yes. example where all the lights have been turned off in the plane i've seen the shadow with my own eyes on the bulkhead of the aircraft and as the aircraft banks you can see the shadow move which is quite impressive that is quite impressive i've not seen that so maybe i'll try it in september uh, moving further out now uh, planet mars very straightforward not visible um it will be coming back, but not until later on next year, into the year, really. So we can, we, Mars is gone for now. But the planet Jupiter oh, yes. is a very prominent morning object, si shining at magnitude minus 2.5, so very, very bright, uh, in southern areas. And the thing I've noticed is just how much, how higher up now Jupiter is compared to the last few years. It really is. Well, to steal, quite, to steal one of your phrases, because it'll reach an altitude of about 50 degrees, it's practically overhead, isn't it? <laughs> it is practically overhead, <laughs> but it felt practically overhead last year because it's been scraping the southern <laughs> horizon for about three years, four years. So, yeah, it's very, very good. And, of course, Jupiter's the amateur's best friend in the sense that 
Uh, even a very small telescope will show details on the cloud markings, the cloud bands, and the four main satellites. Yes. So uh, uh, it's it's nice to have Jupiter whack back where it belongs, prominent in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, and not quite the same for Saturn, but it is improving. Saturn was at opposition at the end of August, um, remains really well placed for observation as far as Saturn goes <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. It's currently in Aquarius, reaching its highest point in the sky, due south all month under dark sky conditions it gets up to about 24 degrees or so which which isn't brilliant but it's better than it has been i think it got to what was it about 11 degrees 12 degrees at one point and that was I'd, horrendous it was horrendous i had a 12 minute window to view it uh between the houses from my location and of course that window is not static it changes every night yes. and you only need a few cloudy nights and you ho it's very difficult to track when it will be prominent so i think that e that apparition i got two or three sightings of saturn and that was it but this it's not practically overhead it might as well be overhead that's uh that's how <laughs> high up it will appear it's, it it's is quite... a go on so I was going to say as well, the other thing that's really noticeable compared to the last few years is now just how shallow the rings are. The, the I was rings just about really to say that, up. yes. The rings have really tilted up now and it's really difficult to, to see the details. So the Cassini division in the rings, uh, don't be disheartened if you, you found, oh, I could see it a couple of years ago, but I can't now. That's quite normal because it's very difficult to, to pull out the finer details in the rings. It's a bit ironic, isn't it, that it's now is actually climbing higher. It's going sideways on, so we can't see the rings as well. Does it's Saturn some, not like us? It's some sort of cosmological prejudice against the northern hemisphere. That's all I can think of. <laughs> well, there's a bright 91% lit waning gibbous moon, 3.3 degrees south of magnitude plus 0.5 Saturn, as the pair approach setting on the morning of the 27th of September. What about the ice giants then? Well, Uranus is a morning planet reaching its highest altitude due south under dark sky conditions from the middle of month onwards. It's not too far from Jupiter actually, it's only about seven and a half degrees away from Jupiter and so um, it should be fairly easy to find. It's just below uh, Botine which is in um, Aries so uh, that's probably the best star to use to navigate to Uranus. Yeah, and once you've found it, it moves quite slowly. So uh, once you've got it, it's probably going to be in about the same position for many, many nights. So we're tracking it down once is the harder part, and then you can kind of remember where it is, and that's it. The biggest, easier. yeah, the biggest problem is the fact that it's it always seems to be in a part of the sky which has got six magnitude stars <laughs> in it, and it it's about magnitude six. So it's quite easy to sort of mistake it for one of the stars it is i go by the greenish color but that's really only obvious uh, to low power in a telescope yes it is so uh, yeah as you say you it's not uncommon to have to try a couple of stars uh, and then finally you get uranus unless of course you you cheat like i do now and just plug it into the go-to and and it's there in moments <laughs> That's that's an admission. That's an admission. All right. What about the planet Neptune? Um, so Neptune reaches opposition this month on the 20th of September, and it's some 35 degrees when due south under dark sky conditions all month long. So it's a good time to, to observe uh, Neptune. Um, you do need a telescope to see the disk. You can see it in binoculars, but to see the disk, you do, you do need a telescope for that. Um, and at magnitude 7.8, it really isn't a naked eye target. You, you no. need optical aid. And it's got a distinctive bluish colour, so, uh, yeah. But again, through a telescope. Yeah, yeah, I, it doesn't reveal much colour through. I have looked, actually, in a variety of finder scopes. Most of my finder scopes are 10 by 40 and, and in binoculars, and it's, it's very difficult. I can't see any colour in Neptune no. until I look through it telescopically. I can remember actually doing a, a Sky at Night programme on Neptune, and I had to have a, a big telescope set up in a portable location. Um, and the it had been cloudy and misty and it was very wet yeah. and then we had a break in the clouds and I had to locate it quickly manually <laughs> and it it was it was surprisingly hard because of the the awkward angle as ever that the finder scope 
was in yeah um to pick it out and every time because it was such a narrow field of view i was looking through you're never quite sure and the seeing was so bad that the stars were dancing around so much that they almost looked as if they had little discs <laughs> inside them. so that was a bit of a nightmare i did get it in the end yeah it, it can be tough to to, to find these things a uh, higher power is what normally does it because uh, it does but then again uh, even under poor seeing Stars will show discs very temporarily under very bad seeing. So, yes, yeah. they will. Um, okay, right. Well, we've got some nice specials this month. Um, on the 5th of September, um, the morning waning gibbous moon sits near Uranus and Jupiter um, at and it's occulting magnitude 4.3. Uh, the star you just mentioned, Pete, Boratine, which is Botin, yeah, yes. it's Delta Ariatus at around 4.45 BST, so that's 3.45 UT. So that's a good introduction to that star if you've never seen it before, because um, if you look for the occultation that'll and sort of work your way to uh, Botine, that'll give you um, heads up on how to find it in the future. On the 6th of September, if you're up and you're looking at the 58% lit waning gibbous moon, you'll see that its liberation favours the southern polar region. So the craters in the, near the South Pole are tilted further towards us. Not so good for the northern part of the moon. And we stick with the moon, actually, on the 7th, when there's an opportunity to see a clear obscure effect. This is a more obscure obscure clear obscure <laughs> effect i guess you'd describe it <laughs> known as a gruthusen's lunar city and that occurs on the evening of the 7th um, with optimum conditions around midnight bst or 23 ut on the 7th and have you ever looked for this paul i have and i thought when i was looking for it it would be just one of those silly things and quite difficult to see um but i did catch it i've only ever seen it once and i caught it under the right illumination conditions probably because we were just done one of these pete and i was quite stunned there's right angles there's geometry yes it's, it does look like a lunar city it's quite incredible it's a it's a weird looking thing it, it's sort of it is quite subtle so don't expect to see a, a city sitting there um but no but it, 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 there's no bright lights or city lights or anything like that no but there's nothing the, going on there but when the light catches it it uh, there are right it just i think the thing that makes it more distinctive is that it sits in a, a patch of the moon that's quite bland yes so it stands out quite readily against the bland background of where it is yeah and it to me it always looks a bit like a, a leaf it's sort of got radial lines yes. coming out and then they're sort of joined together in concentric arcs, if you like. I think people interpret it in different ways, and um, but it is something which is quite interesting to look for. So if you fancy a go at that, then have a look in the magazine where you get some information on that. So uh, what else we got? Well, on the 9th, magnitude minus 4.4 Venus, which we've mentioned already, will sit 0.9 degrees to the south of the seventh magnitude open cluster, M67, in Cancer. Now, we often look at M44, which is the Beehive cluster, but we overlook M67 because that's fainter. Yes. It's a really lovely cluster. Though. It is a lovely cluster, but it is quite faint, and it's well overshadowed by M44. But I think it's quite nice that Venus returns to uh, being near this cluster and, and, and gives it a little highlight. Yes. Um, on the 11th, early risers can catch a 12% lit waning crescent moon uh, about 3.3 degrees north of the other cluster we just mentioned in Cancer, M44. Uh, and magnitude minus 4.4 Venus, very bright, sits 9.4 degrees southeast of that cluster as well. So uh, we've, got, we've got all the clusters represented in Cancer yes. uh, over those couple of days. That's quite pretty. OK, well, on the 14th, we have a thin moon spotting opportunity in the morning sky because obviously the ecliptic is is well presented in terms of the steep angle it's got before sunrise. And if we have any waning crescent moons in that area, they tend to be optimally presented as well. So on the morning of the 14th, there's a less than 1% lit waning crescent moon rising an hour before sunrise. Now, that's going to be really very difficult to see. It's in, some of these are incredibly tricky. I have seen many thin moons in my time, and each one is a, has been a massive challenge when it's below 1% illumination because of the, of the bright twilight, basically. But magnitude plus 1.8 
Mercury will sit 6.3 degrees right of the moon at that time. And again, there are more details in the magazine. This is quite interesting. You can use the less viewed planet in the solar system, Mercury, to find the thin crescent moon. <laughs> it's quite, <laughs> quite interesting. OK, on the 23rd, the centre of the sun crosses the celestial equator at 0650 UT. Uh, and this marks the sun moving from the north celestial hemisphere to the southern celestial hemisphere. And that instant of time when the sun's centre is on the celestial equator uh, marks the northern hemisphere's autumn equinox yes. so uh, after that nights will be starting to draw in and it will be time to uh, wrap up warmer as we're observing absolutely well on the 24th uh, we have a 72 percent lit waxing gibbous moon in the evening sky which has a liberation which evens things up because this one favors the northern polar region so this it is interesting to compare the two if you get clear nights when you have the the good liberation for the southern part of the moon um, so that was on the 6th of september try and take a photograph or do a sketch of the, of the southern part and the northern part and then compare it to how the moon looks on the 24th of september and you'll see there'll be a marked difference between those two regions they're, they're, the difference is quite marked, but one thing they have in common is the amount of detail that's visible even in a small telescope. Yes. I remember early on when I started drawing at the telescope, I did unwisely choose the northern cratered uplands of the moon to, uh, to, to start sketching. And after an hour, I gave up rather disheartened <laughs> because every 15 minutes the light had changed, more detail was visible. It was last like it was just utterly hopeless. But I, I think uh, that's a that's a common <laughs> error actually when you're drawing the moon. I, I remember because I I did used to do look quite a lot of sketching, um, and drawing the moon. The big error is covering an area which is too big. Yeah, because there's just too much detail, and you think, oh, this looks fabulous. I'm going to do the whole of the the Apennine mountain yeah. range. That's and you pretty think, much what I did. <laughs> this is taking a while. Yeah, and of course the light <laughs> changes after about 20 minutes because the Terminator's yes, moving. And you, not only does it all look totally different after that, uh, it reveals more detail, so you'd be there forever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the final well, thing. with Well, on the 29th then, that's when we have a full moon, which yes. shows very little relief detail at all. But this one is the closest full moon to the September equinox, which makes it the harvest moon for 2023 you know you know why the harvest moon gets its name because it, it means it's the fuller phases of the moon appear to rise at more or less the same uh, time on consecutive nights but the difference is really marked you know if you if you go back to the spring when you have the full moon near the spring equinox that's the worst or the, or the greatest difference in time. So the fuller phases are rising around that time. If you go back to sort of April 2023, they were rising with a difference of about 77 minutes wow. between them. That's quite a bit. For this one, around the 29th, so if you go out on the 28th, the 29th and 30th of September, for example, and you time the difference between the rising and the moon, it's 11 minutes. That's, that's even faster. That's quite remarkable. I had never noticed that. I, I, yeah. It's quite. Uh, I always thought that it was named Harvest Moon because it was the moon used by the harvest, people that are the farmers doing the harvest. But well, that, that's why it, it is called that, because the moon rising at more or less the same time is said to be there to light the fields for the harvest collection. Right, I see. But you're that's why it gets the name the Harvest Moon. But you're saying that actually the changes are much more rapid uh, than, uh, than it is back in uh, equivalent times uh, in April uh, yeah it's it's just the the times are minimized near the September equinox and they're maximized or the difference in rise times are maximized near the spring or the northern hemisphere spring equinox the average rise time difference for the moon is about 50 50 minutes 55 minutes something like that so 11 minutes is pretty pretty low it is OK, well, quite impressive. let's move on now to the evening sky. We've got plenty to see. 
Uh, Why don't we start with the Summer Triangle? Yes, that's a good point. So uh, the Summer Triangle is very well placed and it's marked by three very bright, very distinctive stars. We have Deneb in the upper left, that's uh, the star in Cygnus, uh, Vega in the upper right, which is in Lyra, and then at the bottom we have the star Altair which is uh, in Aquila. And those three bright stars make up quite a prominent triangle. They cover quite a bit of distance uh, in the night sky. Yes, so they do. The, 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 uh, it, it do look around for the whole sky if you're looking to see the summer triangle because it, it is quite a large object. I think Vega is probably one of the more distinctive stars there. It's certainly the, the one with the, the brightest apparent magnitude. And that sits above or to the north of a small but distinct diamond pattern of stars, which represents the body of the harp-like instrument, um, the lyre, which it's supposed to represent. But if you point a telescope midway between the two lowest stars of the diamond and a fraction south of that point, you should be able to spot the ring nebula, Messier 57. You have to be careful with this, because if you use a really low magnification, it looks just like a star. So uh, it, it does. It's actually quite an inch. You can tell there's something there, even in a small telescope on low power, this very vague fussy patch. But it's one of these objects that actually stands up to magnification rather well yes. if, if conditions aren't too bad. And it, it, it's just remarkable. Still, it amazes me still, Pete, that you can transform it from a fussy block to a Cheerio. <laughs> quite <laughs> Other breakfast cereals of the same description are also available, but you you, you could it really does become uh, a, a quite a structured object with a dark central core. Yes, uh, I've seen that in a four and a half inch reflector. So, uh, and larger telescopes will reveal sort of faint stars in the nebulosity. Uh, and this is a good time to do it because you're starting to get start darker skies now um, in the summertime. Uh, looking at M57, you're hampered by a, a slightly lighter sky. So this is a good time to try and catch these types of planetary nebulae. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree with that. Well, next door, of course, we've got Cygnus, which represents a giant swan, which is nose diving down towards the horizon, or I should describe it as a swan dive, shouldn't I? The main <laughs> body and beginnings of the giant bird's wings are picked out by another well-known asterism, or unofficial pattern, which is known as the Northern Cross. And that's a very distinctive group of five stars, all belonging to Cygnus. It's a beautiful constellation. Um, I've been following the uh, variable star, Chi Cygni, which is a red giant. It oh, was yes. at maximum and is now slowly on its way down. And, of course, we've got the beautiful Old Biro at the base of the cross, um, but really is a stunning, really is, a, a, I can't emphasise enough what a stunning uh, double star it is. I can't remember, Pete, are they gravitationally bound? Is it actually a binary star? Is it? There's been a lot of toing and froing on this. I think the, the current belief is that they're not. Right. They're just, um, no, they're, they're just a line of sight. Right. The big problem with them is that if they, if they were gravitationally bound, we've only been observing them for a tiny fraction of the the time it takes for them to to do their mutual orbit around one another so there wasn't enough data to be able to to work out whether it was gravitational system or not um, but i believe i might be wrong but i believe that the idea now is that they are not they're just a line of sight yeah OK, well, we'll take that as what it is. Uh, near to uh, Albiro, actually, is this rather obscure constellation, Vulpecula the Fox. Um, it's not very well defined, but there are a couple of really nice objects that are quite easy to find here. Uh, one of them, probably the best well-known object in this area after the Ring Nebula, is M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. That's oh, yeah. really quite a nice object. It's quite easy to see in binoculars as well. Yeah, I used to think it looked like a Dumbbell till you said, no, no, it looks more like an eaten apple core and now i can never get that image out of my mind every time i look at the dumbbell nebula. <laughs> <laughs> we should call it well it's we should call it the apple core nebula then. <laughs> it probably is called that in somewhere or other um but the yeah vulpecula is an odd constellation isn't it it used to be called um vulpecula et ansa which is the fox and the goose and i always remember patrick describing this patrick moore and he used to say I don't know where the goose has gone. Perhaps the fox has eaten him. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> which I thought was rather lovely. Actually, it, it's quite a push to see a fox, to be honest. So, goodness knows where the <laughs> where the goose came from. But do have a look. I think the, sorry, go. 
I was going to say the the Alpha Star. I think is is called Answer, right? Um, so that that is sort of a reference to to the goose, but it's a quite a big constellation. I mean, we see it as a as a bent line, mm. and it but it actually spreads up underneath the eastern wing of um, Cygnus. So it's it is quite large, just very obscure. Yes, a large obscure constellation. Well, there is another object uh, in Volpecula which lies eight degrees due south of Albiro and close to the little flight of stars that we call Sagitta the Arrow, a very distinctive little constellation. And this is Brocchi's Cluster, which is also known as the Coat Hanger. And this is one of the very few clusters that's na- that looks like something it's named after. It does look rather like a coat hanger. It does look exactly like a coat hanger. It's Colander 399 is its uh, cluster designation, which is ironic because it isn't a cluster at all. It's an asterism. It's a line of sight <laughs> of, of stars. But they all line up to look exactly like a coat hanger. Yes, uh, it's quite a distinctive uh, little object, worth a look. And hanging to the south of the star Epsilon Cygni um, is a fourth magnitude star known as 52 Cygni. And this is what well, can be used as a marker to a rather fantastic object known as the Veil Nebula. This, oh, yes. is the rem- this is the remains of a star that exploded in a supernova explosion. It exploded and the remnants of that explosion is the Veil Nebula. Now, our star won't end its life in a supernova explosion. It's not anywhere near a massive enough, but massive stars do. And this is all that remains of one particular massive star. But it's an interesting object. Have you photographed it? I think you've got some images of it, haven't you, Pete? I, I did in, in the my sort of vague days of messing about with deep sky imaging. Um, I did get some photographs of it. It's fair, Some of it is quite bright. Some of it's quite faint. You can see it with a naked eye as well reasonably well the brighter bits the witch's broom is quite quite nice to to look for but it's it is a nice object it's um surprisingly rewarding i would say okay well the eastern wing uh tip bridges the gap between summer and autumn uh by stretching towards the constellation of pegasus the flying horse and yes it is probably one of the most obvious constellations in the autumn sky the square of pegasus being particularly noticeable, although the square isn't made of really bright stars and it and it is, spans quite a large area, but it is very very distinctive once you've uh, once you've seen it. It is, and you know it it really does stand out. It's it's an odd shape. I can remember seeing it from the southern hemisphere and looking at it and thinking, what's wrong with it? And you, I think it's because it's upside down from the southern hemisphere oh, yes and pegasus is the right way up the great square looks misshapen because it isn't a square it is misshapen anyway but you get yeah. to see it in, a, in an odd way and it, it took me a while to sort of figure out what was what was going on for that well we're heading into the sort of autumn sky here so we'll, we'll sort of wrap up just by mentioning that coming off the great square of pegasus of course we've got the constellation of andromeda the chained princess and that's the home of the superb andromeda galaxy messier 31 which is starting is now beginning to get into m31 season <laughs> isn't it and it'll it'll get better in october and november it's pretty well placed then yes we'll talk about more about those in upcoming virtual planetarium so yeah plenty to see in the september night sky brilliant thank you very much paul thanks pete